Uh, my name is Mike, uh, I'm a PhD student at MIT. As a quick administrative note, I want to note that you can get the slides that I'll be presenting uh, at my personal website here down in this corner, moberst.com. Uh, if you want to follow along, I'll also remind you about that link afterwards, uh, in part because I'll include some references uh, at the end of this presentation, which uh, might be of interest to a broader group of people. So uh, with that, let me just set up my screen here. All right, so let's get started. Uh, my goals are as follows today. So first, uh, I want to give everyone just kind of a basis uh, in what causal effects are and under what assumptions we can infer those from observational data. I also want to talk a bit about, uh, I'll, I'll defer talking about estimation of causal effects in that first section because I want to talk about it in the context of policy evaluation uh, and how some causal effects are, can be used as a special case of policy evaluation. And I'll obviously talk a bit more then about what policies are and how we evaluate them more generally. And then we'll conclude by talking a bit about how policy evaluation, that is being given a fixed policy and being able to tell me how good it is at achieving some outcome, relates to learning policies from data. Um, but first, uh, we'll start with the basics because understanding causal effects and understanding the assumptions that are required uh, to estimate causal effects is going to form the bedrock for anything we try and do that's you know, a little more sophisticated like learning policies. So this will be a very quick crash course uh, in causal effects. So assuming kind of no background knowledge, uh, we'll start kind of from the bottom up. So what is a causal effect? Well, uh, as a layperson, there are plenty of questions we ask that are causal questions, uh, particularly in medicine, uh, you might think about questions like, what's the effect of some drug on some set of outcomes in a certain patient population? So uh, whether that's something to do with cardiac outcomes, as in this first example, or more recently in the news, uh, the effect of hydroxychloroquine on adverse events in COVID-19 patients. And oftentimes, it is either uh, useful to get a first cut at these questions by using non-randomized data, so that's what I mean when I say observational data. This would include, for instance, looking at the medical record uh, or looking at large insurance claims data sets uh, to better understand the answers to these questions. There are other settings, maybe not so much with these specific questions, where randomization is also infeasible. So a classic example of this would be that you wouldn't randomize people to smoke to see if it causes lung cancer. Uh, since from observational data, we have a pretty good sense of what the effect is. Uh, so with that, just a little bit of a, a sense of what observational studies uh, look like and what types of conclusions people try and draw. This is an example of a study recently published in The Lancet that looked at the comparative effectiveness of several uh, first-line antihypertension drugs. So a conclusion coming out of this is something like, one type of drug or one drug class thiazide shows better primary effectiveness than another. And this is really a statement about averages. So, and it's a causal statement. So if you know, the implication is, you know, the hope of this study is that if you actually applied this in practice and you gave more people thiazide and less people ACE inhibitors, that you would see better outcomes. But of course, uh, there's some tricky nuances here, and so we'll start to get into those. Before we talk about uh, methods, I want to first ground us in some formalism. So I'll be using the potential outcomes framework uh, or language to talk about this. Uh, but there are, of course, a variety of other ways you can formalize this problem. Uh, for our particular setting, all functionally equivalent. So we're going to talk, we're going to imagine in our minds uh, almost a philosophical notion that each patient has associated with them a set of potential outcomes. And those are the different types of outcomes uh, that would happen to them potentially if we were to treat them a certain way. And then you might ask questions like, what is the average treatment effect? So if you take this patient here and you imagine that uh, treatment A is giving some kind of drug 
and treatment B is a placebo, then the average treatment effect is like one of the things we commonly estimate, say, in a randomized control trial. But for the purposes of this talk, I also want to focus on these quantities individually, which can be useful when there are more than two treatments. Uh, for instance, if you're selecting from a list of drugs, uh, or, uh, you know, or in part because this will make it easier to understand policy evaluation uh, for reasons I'll get into later. So I'm gonna call all of the following things causal effects, one being uh, the average potential outcome for a given treatment over the whole population, uh, and the other being something like the average treatment effect. The challenge, of course, is that we don't observe all outcomes uh, in our data, or at least we don't observe all outcomes for all patients. So uh, here I'm, I'm constructing a, a hypothetical example. I do not have data on this, so please don't quote me uh, on this, but it's something you might imagine could occur. Uh, imagine you are trying to understand uh, in-hospital treatment of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, where you have a bunch of patients who come into the hospital, you notice that some of them were sent to the intensive care unit and others were discharged home. And you would like to understand something about maybe how better to treat them. And you might notice an association in the data, a correlation, that individuals who are sent to the intensive care unit, that's what the ICU stands for, uh, for instance, where you might get put on a mechanical ventilator, that those individuals have higher mortality rates than those who are discharged home. So uh, I think it's probably obvious to everyone uh, on this Zoom that we shouldn't stop sending patients to the ICU. Um, but at this point, I want to test out uh, asking audience questions. So can anyone venture a guess as to why you might see a correlation like this in the data? And we'll see how this works. Or I suppose people can put their response in the chat. I don't think I can see the chat. Very sick people go into the ICU. Yes, so um, I think what I heard was more sick people going to the ICU. And that's exactly right. So there's, there's some confounding factor uh, here, which is that the patient population that gets prescribed to the treatment of go to the ICU is different in some way than the patient population, uh, than the whole patient population, right? They're gonna be sicker on average, they're going to the ICU for a reason. And so in our more formal notation, we might write that as uh, the expectation of this potential outcome is not equal to the expectation of the outcome we observe given that we condition on that particular patient population that receives treatment. So, you know, thanks for coming to my TED talk. Uh, everyone now understands that correlation does not imply causation, but obviously today we're going a bit beyond that. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about how carefully chosen correlations can imply causations and the types of assumptions we need to make uh, to get there. And again, this, this might be reviewed for some people in the audience, but uh, important everyone's on the same page for when we get to policy evaluation. So we're gonna have to make assumptions to go from correlation to causation. Uh, the first set of assumptions is going to be the first two that I've listed here, consistency and nil interference, which together are saying that when I give someone a treatment in the data, like when I observe that someone received a drug in my data set, that the outcome I observe is this philosophical notion of a potential outcome that we talked about earlier. So reasons that that might be violated, for instance, would include uh, if certain patients do not take the drugs that they're given, then even though we observe that as the treatment, it's not really what they received. That's not really what they took. Uh, and interference is another concern. So in the context of maybe treating uh, cancer with chemotherapy, it's likely that the treatment that I give you is really all that matters. Like the treatment I give other people doesn't have an impact on your outcome. But in the context of an infectious disease, you could imagine that's a bit different. Right? If I had a vaccine for some disease and I gave that vaccine to everyone except for you, then that would probably have an impact on your chance of catching the disease, even though I didn't treat you directly. So in our setting, we're just going to be focused on, uh, we're going to assume that we have consistency 
and that there's no interference. We can think of people as these atomic units. Third, uh, there is this assumption of no unmeasured confounding, uh, and that's kind of visualized here on the right as well with a causal graph, uh, for those who are familiar with that kind of notation. We're, we're simply put, uh, we've measured all of the relevant variables in X that impact both treatment and the outcome. So in the ICU example I gave, if your data set did not include some notion of patient severity, right, which is influencing whether or not they go to the ICU in the first place, you wouldn't be able to draw causal conclusions. So we have to assume, uh, and there are relaxations of some of these things that I won't get into, but um, for our purposes, we're assuming that there's no unmeasured confounding. Uh, and then finally, there is this last condition of overlap and coverage, which uh, I won't get into, uh, I won't dwell too much on right now because I'll come back to it later, but this is in the context of average treatment effects, the assumption that all types of patients receive all treatments or have some positive probability of receiving all treatments. So with that, uh, these assumptions allow us to take what is a causal query and kind of transmute it through our causal assumptions into a statistical query, something that we can actually evaluate on our observational data set. And if our causal assumptions are wrong, then this statistical query might not map to uh, what we hope it does. But for our purposes, we'll assume causal assumptions are correct. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what these average potential outcomes uh, are in terms of statistical quantities. So here I've plotted X, which is an abstract patient feature. Uh, you can imagine that it is whatever you'd like it to be, uh, and Y, which is the outcome, and we're going to assume higher is better. So the inner part of this expression is a conditional expectation of the outcome given patient covariates and the treatment. You know, and this outer expression is an average over the distribution of X. So you can imagine this blue line being the conditional expectation, and then the average potential outcome being the average of the heights of these blue dotted lines. Of course, if I change the distribution of X, then the average potential outcome will change because it depends in part on this distribution of X, even if the conditional does not. You know, you can imagine plotting this for a different treatment, but then an average treatment effect is nothing more than the difference between uh, these two. So what we referred to earlier as an average treatment effect uh, would be the difference between these two lines averaged over the uh, gray triangles, which are representing our distribution of X. And you can also talk about heterogeneous treatment effects, uh, conditional average treatment effects, uh, one and the same, where there's some subset of X that I'm conditioning on. And then as I move that around, I might see a different average within that subset. So for instance, uh, the point that I've picked here, the average treatment effect conditionally is probably around zero. Whereas here, you know, it would be a bit different in favor of treatment B. So that's a very uh, quick tour through what causal effects are uh, and a bit of the nomenclature notation and assumptions. Um, I think I'll stop here to see if there are any questions. I haven't talked about estimation yet, and I will, um, but any uh, questions so far? I, I can't see the chat. I don't think I can see participant view, so I rely on one of the moderators to help me out here. No questions? Michael, could you go back to the uh, the equation a couple slides back with of expectations? Yep. Yeah. Just uh, I thought it might be nice to hold that for questions. Great. All right, doesn't, I guess it doesn't seem like there are uh, questions. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think we can move on. All right. So again, maybe a bit of review for uh, folks in the audience, but important to have this context. So then I'll talk a bit about uh, policy evaluation. So first, what is a policy? Uh, a policy maps from observed features of the data to recommended actions. Uh, and for our purposes, you can think of this as a function pi, uh, which does this mapping. And we can think of deterministic policies. So you give me patient features and I recommend you an action. Uh, 
there are uh, stochastic variants of this, but uh, not going to be relevant for this talk. So then, in this setting, uh, I'm going to claim that this particular causal effect, uh, the average potential outcome, uh, that this expression is actually giving me the value of a particular policy. Uh, and can anyone just shout out uh, what policy is being uh, evaluated here? Is it just do A? Yep, exactly right. So this is a constant policy, right? Uh, it's not much of a policy because we're not using X at all, uh, but this is uh, in some sense uh, a uh, value of a policy. And I'll use that term more as I talk about policy evaluation uh, as kind of I'll get into more on this slide. So given, a pol given some policy that doesn't necessarily map to a constant value, uh, we can write a similar expression for the uh, value of that policy, where now our expectation is again over potential outcomes, but these potential outcomes, the ones that we choose are going to depend on what actions our policy is recommending at different values of x. So you can imagine a very simple policy here. This is just a, again, I have a very simple figure, so I can have a very simple policy where I just have a single threshold. And then everyone with x below a certain value is going to receive treatment A, and everyone with x above a certain value is going to receive treatment B. And so then the value of this policy is going to look something like this, uh, where before I was averaging over just one of these lines. Now I'm going to you know, choose the conditional expectation that's relevant based on what treatment I would be assigning someone. And again, uh, you can think of the expectation as depending on the distribution of x and then being the average of the heights of these various lines. And if I had a different threshold, I would have a different value, right? Because this would be a different policy. So with that, I'll talk a bit about how we do policy evaluation in practice. You know, so far I've been cheating. I've just been displaying conditional expectations uh, as if we knew what those were. Um, in reality, we have data and we have to estimate these things from data. So the first uh, method that you might think to use uh, is quite straightforward and it follows the intuition of what I just described, which is to model the conditional expectation directly uh, using this function f of x t. And then at each data point uh, in uh, ideally a held out set, I'm, I'm glossing over some statistical details of things like sample splitting here. But what you'd like to do is you'd like to have this function and then you would like to evaluate it uh, at each data point x, plugging in the treatment that your policy recommends. And again, this is all for a fixed policy that someone's just given to me. So that's fairly intuitive. Another method is propensity reweighting. And I should note that both of these methods go by various names. Uh, I have kind of just picked some uh, to talk about here, but you might see this as uh, inverse uh, probability weighting. You might see this as important sampling. And what we're doing here is, uh, I don't know if folks can see my cursor, but uh, we have an indicator function here where we're basically going to take a subset of our data uh, where the observed actions follow the policy's recommendations. And then we're going to reweight those outcomes by uh, the inverse probability of observing that treatment in our data set. And if you kind of uh, expand out what this ex statistical expression is here at the top, uh, you can convince yourself that this will also give you, uh, you know, an estimate of that quantity. The good news is that we don't necessarily have to pick between these two. Uh, in both outcome regression and propensity reweighting, you know, we rely on the assumption that the models that we're positing for the conditional outcome models, as well as the propensity models, uh, right, respectively, are correct. They're well specified. You know, with infinite data, we will get exactly the right answer. But in a doubly robust formulation, uh, you can actually combine these two in such a way that you only need to get one of them right. And I'll caveat that with, you know, to get consistency in the limited infinite data. So 
what is this? Well, we basically got over here our conditional outcome model that we have from this part. And then we're effectively adding a, a bias correct, or maybe we shouldn't call it a bias correction term, something like a correction term, where we are reweighting uh, in much the same way as we did here, the residuals for individuals where their treatment was consistent with the policy. So that's a bit about- Michael. Yeah, please. Could you, could you unpack the intuition of one and two a little bit more? I wanna, I'm sorry if I'm slowing you down. Actually, no, I'm not sorry. I, I wanna slow you down and ask you to unpack those Great. two a little bit more and why we would wanna combine them. Great, so um, the intuition for the first one, um, I will, uh, go back to this slide actually. So you can think of these lines as being the functions that we're trying to estimate here. So I have uh, here some estimate, maybe by my favorite machine learning model of the conditional expectation of Y given X is X and T is T. Uh, and basically what I can do is I can imagine if I had this, like if I actually had this conditional expectation and I modeled it correctly, then I could just plug it in up here uh, while plugging in whatever the treatment is for each value of x um, that my policy recommends. Uh, and then I would simply take an average of those predictions over x. And so that's what this expression is saying. It's just writing the average explicitly as over some number of samples. Uh, and you know, effectively what this is doing is you know, at each point x, picking which of these two lines I should be using, uh, these two conditional expectations, and then kind of giving me that, that height of that uh, line. Um, for, for the reweighting part, uh, you can, uh, let's see, I, I don't have a good slide for this, but I'll, I'll do my best to convey the, the intuition here. Um, you're basically trying to take uh, individuals who received treatment, uh, the treatment that you're considering, and reweight them so that they look like uh, the whole population. So for instance, if your population contains, you know, a pretty uniform distribution of ages, but the, and let's say you have a constant policy, uh, just for simplicity, but this treatment uh, is mostly given to older patients and only very rarely given to young patients. Then you're gonna have a lot of outcomes in your data of receiving this treatment for older patients and very few outcomes for younger patients. And so what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to reweight those. Basically, you're gonna to wanna to upweight the outcome for the younger patient because that's gonna help you get a more representative average for the whole population. Uh, and that's one way you can think about it. Is Mike? Yep. Sorry, I just wanted to go back a minute. Uh, we had a question from the audience from Fred, um, who's asking if you'll be mentioning cases where the treatment for a given patient is not constant, but changes with time, potentially due to other covariate changes with time as well. Uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, I should have clarified this earlier on, when we talk about, when I talk about policy evaluation in the context of this talk, uh, in part because of time constraints, I'm gonna be focused on a single time step. So the question I think is related to uh, sequential decision-making, where if I go back to my, uh, maybe this is a mistake going all the way back, but if we go back to my causal graph, I'm thinking about there's a single treatment uh, that's gonna be given, a single decision to make as opposed to unfolding this graph over time and then looking at a policy that involves uh, changing the response to, to covariates. So no, I will not be getting into that today. So a lot of the same uh, ideas will apply. Just one more quick thing I wanted to say to the audience. If you have a short question, please go ahead and just unmute yourself and you can ask the speaker directly. But if you'd like, you're also welcome to use a raise hand and I'll, I'll call on you or relay the question through chat. And, and say your name. Um, sorry, I didn't. I'm Alex. Great. Any other quick questions? If not, um, I will 
talk a little bit about some of the, the problems that arise, uh, a particular subset of problems that arise when you try and do policy evaluation from observational data. Uh, and I'm going to focus in particular on this last bit. So I'm not going to talk about unmeasured confounding. Uh, I'm going to assume these first three assumptions hold. Um, and my point will be that even if those three assumptions hold, uh, which seem like you know, big ones, that there can still be statistical challenges uh, in being able to estimate the values of, of all policies. So, you know, part of this is because we've been cheating, right? We've been talking about uh, conditional expectations without too much talk about data, except for the slide that I just showed with some estimators. So in reality, our data might look something like this. And now we have to do something with this data. So what we might try and do is fit maybe a conditional uh, expectation to this data, but then we're gonna have a problem because for this particular treatment, treatment B, over here on the left, there is no data, right? Uh, no one, it seems like in the, maybe in the hospital where we collected this data from, that no one below a certain value of X ever received treatment B. Uh, so for all, for all we know, the probability of this happening is zero. Um, and in order to estimate this conditional expectation in this region, we have to extrapolate. Um, to, the, to the point about reweighting earlier, um, what we would want to do if we were taking the propensity reweighting approach is uh, reweight uh, samples by you know, one over uh, their probability of re receiving treatment. So if this, that treatment probability goes to zero, we're, we're gonna have a problem there as well. But uh, it gets a little tricky because really everything depends on the idea that this conditional expectation exists. And if uh, the treatment just doesn't get given for certain people, uh, kind of doesn't. So anyway, you can think of this without uh, too much loss of uh, intuition as just we're trying to estimate these using models and we're going to have to extrapolate uh, if we don't observe anyone who doesn't receive a certain treatment at a certain point. So in my example I just gave, you've got the same issue for blue uh, for treatment A, it's just in the other direction. And this is where assumptions like coverage or overlap come into play. So this is an assumption that's testable in the data, which is nice. Okay, um, and it states that for all values of X, and for the treatment that our policy is recommending for that value of X, we're just gonna require that that treatment shows up in the data for these types of patients with some positive probability. Though in practice, you might want it to be bounded away from zero uh, as opposed to just uh, bigger than zero. You don't want it to be arbitrarily small. And in the conceptual example I gave, that was kind of the problem. But, you know, I know that this depends on the policy, right? So we don't, uh, there is some flexibility here, uh, and we can, for instance, hope to be evaluating policies that are maybe uh, impossible to evaluate, as opposed to policies that are not. Uh, so I guess I'd, I'd kick this out to the audience. Um, can anyone give me an example of a simple policy that uh, can be evaluated here that satisfies the coverage condition? if not I'll volunteer one, which is picking a threshold. So some of those thresholding policies I talked about before, you know, if I set a threshold here in the middle and I say give treatment A below the threshold and treatment B above the threshold, then the coverage condition is gonna be, it's gonna hold for this policy because I'm not giving treatment B over here and I'm not giving treatment A over here. But what about something like the average treatment effect? Uh, is that something that we can estimate kind of from this conceptual data that I just gave. Any volunteers from the audience? Can you repeat the question? So the, the question is, uh, can I estimate the average treatment effect uh, from this data without making you know, parametric assumptions around these conditional expectations? Not if the distribution of X extends to the regions where, you know, you can't evaluate the other policy. Yeah, 
So, so great. So if, if I'm doing this average treatment effect over this whole span of X that I've drawn, I'm going to run into a problem, right? Which is that uh, in, for intuition, you can think about what I talked about before regarding sort of the expectation of one of these potential outcomes being a, um, essentially evaluating a blanket policy. You know, I can't evaluate both of these blanket policies uh, because they're not, you know, if I plug it into my coverage condition, that's going to require that at all points of X that I care, you know, at all points of X that I'm evaluating the ATE over, uh, I need all treatments to have some positive probability. Uh, and I've told you that that does not hold. Now, sometimes you'll see that condition just written out, uh, not in terms of coverage and policies and then the condition, uh, but you'll just see it written out as uh, positivity, sometimes also called overlap, uh, where you just say that all treatments have some positive probability of occurring at all values of X. And, have a question. you know, that was an example of, okay, I can't evaluate um, that difference and I can't evaluate maybe fixed policies like the blanket policy of always give treatment A across all of X. Uh, but I think very insightfully, as you probably answered that question, uh, I think it was noted that, you know, it depends a bit on what sort of range of X, what support of X you care about. So you might be in a situation in which you care about this policy. You want to know what would happen uh, on average if I gave everyone treatment A, uh, and you're willing to just restrict yourself to the set of X where you can actually make statements to that effect. Uh, Fred, so did you have a question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you turn up your mic or speak closer to it? It's very hard to hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, sorry about that. Oh, I'll you. turn up my mic a little bit. Oh, no, I, I meant Fred. Oh. Can you hear me now? Uh, we hear you a bit better now, Fred. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. You you mentioned that uh, when uh, the the coverage is an issue for those reweighting method because then you're dividing by pretty much zero. But what about the outcome regression approaches? Are they still affected by uh, coverage or, or why? Uh, yes. So if so, if I'll go back to this example, um, outcome regression is affected by coverage. Uh, insofar as you don't want to make strong parametric assumptions. So you might say, uh, you, you sort of take one of two approaches. You can say, on the one hand, you can be pessimistic, which is kind of what I'm giving here, a little bit of a pessimistic take, where I have no idea what this curve looks like in the, in the question mark region. And if I don't observe any data there, I don't want to make a guess. I, you know, I want to, maybe I want to be very non-parametric about my modeling um, and so on. On the other hand, uh, you could be a bit more optimistic and you could say, well, this curve kind of looks like a, you know, maybe a low degree polynomial. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I can just extrapolate to this region. Uh, and that's what I'm highlighting here is just that that's an assumption uh, and that if you, are not willing to make those kinds of parametric assumptions about what this conditional expectation looks like uh, in this region, uh, then uh, you're kind of stuck. Okay, thank you. So yes, it is a problem for, for the outcome regression approach as well. Any other questions? Great. So. Uh, if you're, if you're, you know, quick shameless plug, if you're curious uh, more on this particular topic of um, finding kind of the regions where we can evaluate a fixed policy, uh, you know, we have a paper recently in uh, AI Stats, uh, which is kind of on this topic. Uh, let me just make sure my slides are working well. Okay. But with that, I'll move quickly into the, the final part of the presentation talking about how policy evaluation uh, ties into learning optimal policies. So uh, another quick, I would hope, uh, audience question. Um, can anyone tell me from this? Now, forget about what I just said about lack of data. We're going back to the world in which we observe these conditional expectations perfectly and there's support everywhere and it's very nice. Um, can anyone venture a guess as to what the optimal policy is in this situation? <laughs> 
folks, come on, wake up. <laughs> no, I, I'm just trying to encourage more people to chime in. I don't want to answer all the questions. Yeah, about a certain threshold, you will pick one treatment and then otherwise the other one or something like that. Yeah, great. So, you know, I talked about thresholding policies before. It seems like uh, the optimal thing to do here, if you really knew this was the truth, would be to set a threshold right where these lines cross, you know, give the blue treatment below it and the red treatment above it. So this would then be the value of that policy, you know, in keeping with our conceptual figures from before. Uh, and that is one approach. Now, we just talked about thresholding and I'll, I'll let's for a moment make this a little more uh, algorithmic where we're just literally going to look at our conditional expectations and we're going to pick the conditional expectation that has the highest value. Um, that is in some sense uh, an intuitive place to start. And this is referred to as an indirect method. So. We have, I'll remind you from before, perhaps these conditional outcome models that we learned. Uh, and we're simply going to ask for any new patient who comes in. We're going to plug their information into our respective models. And we're going to recommend the treatment uh, which has the highest predicted value. Now, obviously, this is very dependent on our outcome regression being kind of well specified. Uh, and the resulting policy uh, can also be fairly complicated. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why. So again, we're going we're gonna to toggle back to thinking about, you know, we don't have these directly, we're estimating them from data. So maybe when we estimate them from data, there's a bit of noise, right? Uh, that's, as is commonly the case when you don't have an infinite amount of data. Uh, you can't estimate things perfectly. And so there are going to be these regions, maybe here on the left and the right. I'll toggle back and forth just briefly to remind you what these look like in expectation. Uh, on the left and the right, we're probably going to get those, we're probably going to figure out the maximum uh, fairly well as long as we have enough data from those regions. But in the middle, these are very close to each other, right? And so it doesn't take, we're not really going to have enough power probably in our data set to reliably distinguish which one is better. Um, but also probably doesn't really matter because they're very close and that's part of the reason that it's, it's tough to break the tie. But as a result, if we really adhere to our, you know, take the maximum predicted value uh, approach, we might get a fairly complicated policy, like you know, something like this. And an observation I'll make is that we might believe in advance um, or for reasons of interpretability think that we'd rather have, for instance, a thresholding-based policy. Um, that could be because we believe that's sort of actually optimal, or it could be that, you know, these curves, um, that, that the ground truth actually is very complicated, right? Um, but we want a simple policy for the purposes of interpretability. Uh, so what would you like to do there? Well, you'd like to learn such a threshold while taking into account that you care more about you know, getting it right on the left and the right here than you do maybe about getting it exactly right here in the middle. Um, and the reason is because you know, left and the right, the differences are much bigger. So you're, um, you want to make sure you get it right there. And that's where we come into uh, direct approaches to policy uh, optimization. So we can pick a certain class of policy functions. So these might be decision trees, these might be uh, thresholds like I talked about before, uh, or linear functions on the data, effectively a linear classifier. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our, you know, uh, estimate from before of the value of a given policy, and we're basically going to try and find the policy that maximizes that estimate of value. Now, I'm going to replace this estimate with one of the particular estimates, which was the uh, W robust uh, estimator that I talked about. Uh, and I, I'm happy to come back to this if folks have more questions, but the point here is that uh, what I want you to take away from here, take away from this, is that we can optimize over a simple policy class, even if uh, we allow our outcome models and our propensity models to be very flexible and complicated. Like maybe we need to do that because our data is complicated, uh, but we'd still like to pick the best simple policy that we can, given those estimates. And 
it is conceptually straightforward uh, to add other actions. And to this, though, I, I won't talk about as much about that in this talk. Um, uh, David might touch on this in his presentation. But what I want to focus on here in just the last few minutes is that it's not obvious how to optimize this. Um, Can you remind so, us w hat, what w hat is again, notation? Uh, yes. So I'll just leave this, this up. So it's oh, I'm missing a parenthesis uh, in there as well. There should be a parenthesis over here next to one. But this is the uh, W robust uh, estimator just on the, on the individual sample level. Thanks. Um, so this is, this is difficult to optimize uh, and not for a statistic, in addition to all the statistical things we've talked about, uh, just practically for, from a, an optimization perspective, or a computational. And that is because uh, we have these, I'll skip to here. And that is because we have these indicator functions. Um, it makes the problem non-convex. Uh, in, in in you can imagine certain situations in which you can come up with a very, very bad worst case where I actually have to try out every policy uh, in my class, or at least a very large number of them, in order to figure out which one is best. And we'd like to avoid that. So I won't go uh, running, I think, we're supposed to go until 8.45, is that right? Or I'm sorry, I'm on a different time zone, uh, till 10.35? So we have a few minutes we can go. Yeah, if you have another 10 minutes, then we'll take a five minute break and start David's talk. Okay, great. So uh, I, don't know, I don't have a ton more uh, to say, but uh, you know, we'll also open it up for questions. It'll be good to have time for questions at the end. So I'll give you a flavor uh, of the types of things that is done. Uh, David's going to go over I think, a specific example of this uh, in his talk. Um, but a flavor of the types of things you might do to make this optimization problem easier to solve. Uh, and I say policy optimization is classification because a lot of these are the same types of uh, techniques you use when trying to get around the intractability of zero one classification uh, from an optimization perspective. So you, know, you do things like convert this to a, a minimization and then try to make the indicators convex uh, in some way. Perhaps instead of using an indicator, you use something like a cross entropy uh, loss uh, and redefine the weights as necessary so that the whole thing remains convex. So for instance, uh, if I've managed to make uh, the other terms in this sum convex, like those indicators, then I might want my weights to remain non-negative so that the entire uh, objective remains convex. Now, if you didn't, I just throw out a lot of optimization terminology. If, if, some of that was, if some of that is not familiar to you, don't worry too much about it. Um, I have references at the end of this where you can you know, dig into your heart's content to some of these issues. Uh, all you need to take away is that the optimization problem as written is tricky to solve, so we reformulate it as a different optimization problem that is easier to solve but has the same optimal solution, at least in the kind of limit of, uh, at least in a, uh, maybe expectation, for instance. So that's the, that's the main content that I had. Uh, hopefully people are walking away with maybe a refined understanding uh, or just a quick review of what causal effects are, how causal effect estimation relates to policy evaluation uh, and how policy evaluation can be used sort of in an objective function that's used to optimize policies directly. Uh, and I have some, some references here. Uh, really we have a question from Luca uh, in the chat. Uh, yeah, Luca asks, are these problems present for stochastic policies as well? Um, Not, uh, I don't want to make a blanket statement like they're not a problem, but that, that does get right at this, uh, that, this difficulty. Um, and just like, uh, just like when you're dealing with classification, uh, you, you convert this loss not from like a, an indicator of like I'm right or I'm wrong, but you actually look at you know, in classification the probabilities and so you 
uh, are in some sense replacing the deterministic output of your classifier, uh, yes or no, with the probabilistic output of your classifier. Uh, and so in a similar way, if you were thinking about a stochastic policy, you would get around um, a lot of the difficulty that I just talked about. And in fact, when you think about some of this, uh, and that, that might be a, a fruitful way to think about when I say convex surrogate, what I'm talking about. Um, the optimal policy will still, will, uh, the optimal policy is generally a deterministic one because there is a best action to take. Um, but going the route of stochastic policies, just from an optimization perspective, can kind of help you uh, approach that in a smooth way. But what, great question. What, the, thanks. That's a, a nice answer. Um, the, I'm a bit confused by the language convex surrogate for the indicator. I mean, the, you make the whole optimization a convex optimization, I'm guessing. But, but what, what do you mean by surrogate for the indicator function itself? Um, maybe that is a, maybe just a poor use of, of terminology there. Um, uh, I, I, what I, what I'm trying to refer to here is specifically, um, maybe, maybe it's more fruitful to think of, I'm going to come up with a convex surrogate for this whole thing. Um, and maybe in terms of the indicator functions, uh, there are, um, it, it's a bit of, what I've written on the slide is a bit of, uh, by way of analogy to, um, zero one loss, where you think of a convex surrogate for that loss. Um, so perhaps it is uh, better said that the whole we're coming up with a convex surrogate for the whole thing, as opposed to for the indicator in particular. And um, is it is it a relaxation in the sense of expanding the domain, or, or is, uh, it, is, is it too technical to get into right now? That's okay too. I, I think it, I think it might be best um, if folks are curious about this particular topic. I point you. Uh, particularly to this first of these recommended readings. Um, uh, you can just see from the title, uh, relaxation of, uh, uh, relaxations right there, just, uh, you know, as you mentioned, talking about optimization. Um, so I, I will make a caveat on these, on these sort of recommended readings. Uh, this is a pretty cursory list. Uh, I, I pulled uh, just a set of recent papers. Uh, and part of the reason I did that uh, was so that through looking at these papers, you can find good references to the broader literature. So don't read too much into the uh, set of papers that I put on this slide, uh, though I will call out the first one as being a, a great reference for some of the issues that were just raised uh, in the questions. Uh, but yeah, uh, and, and again, these slides are available on my website. Uh, if folks uh, want to take a closer look. It's a real pleasure to be back at MIA. Uh, it's been a couple of years since my last talk here. And I'm sorry that we couldn't be in person, but I'm looking forward to our discussions remotely. So the work I'll be talking about today is joint with two master students of mine, Suraj Bhumanathan and Helen Chow, both of who, am, who have since graduated from MIT. Uh, my PhD student, Michael Oberst, who gave the primer earlier today, and our clinical collaborator, Sanjat Kanjalal, uh, who's currently at Brigham Women's Hospital uh, and a lecturer at Harvard. And it was really Sanjat who spearheaded this effort uh, that I'll be telling you about on our work on antibiotic resistance. And I run the clinical machine learning group at MIT and CSAIL and the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science, IMS. So, my lab looks at how one could use machine learning to improve healthcare. And much of the earlier work in my lab had focused on questions of how we could use machine learning for diagnosis and how one could use machine learning for prognosis. But what we've been starting to think about much more recently has been how one could use machine learning to guide treatment suggestions. And that'll be the focus of today's talk. So clinicians make treatment suggestions via a very complex process where they have discussions with patients, they take into consideration test results, medical records, and so on. And ultimately then they make a decision of what treatment to recommend to administer for this patient. So for example, here, uh, this doctor would select treatment B. What we'll be thinking about in today's talk is how one could use machine learning to recommend the best treatment. So perhaps treatment A would be more effective for this 
for this patient, and we would prefer to recommend treatment A over treatment B. Now, of course, building models to recommend the best treatment is really at the heart of the goal of precision medicine. But even with much more mundane treatment policies, this work could have a big impact in start helping standardize best practices across, uh, across both academic and non-academic medical centers. And even in just discovering new treatment policies from data using data-driven approaches. So the running example that I'll be giving throughout today's talk is of that of empiric antibiotic treatment for urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections affect one in two women in their lifetime, and it's the third most common cause for antibiotic treatment. And the reason why that is particularly irrelevant for us is because we will be thinking about the amount of second line antibiotic usage uh, with a particular eye on seeing how we could try to mitigate the amount of second line usage in order to hopefully reduce the uh, the amount of uh, bacteria uh, that are growing with antibiotic resistance. So um, typically a woman with urinary tract infection after meeting, their, uh, meeting with their clinician um, would give a sample and that sample would then be sent to a laboratory and a antibiotic susceptibility profile would be run on that sample, uh, which could potentially take up to a week. That profile uh, would be obtained by uh, uh, culturing the sample, uh, in essence, splitting it up into several different subsamples, and each one of those subsamples administering uh, multi uh, one of multiple different antibiotics. Uh, over here, I'm showing you a few of the most common ones that we'll be considering in today's talk, such as nitrofurantinin, which is a uh, first line antibiotic, and uh, superfloxacin, which is a second line antibiotic. The result of that profile will tell us whether the particular sample, the bacteria that this, that this uh, woman has, is whether it is uh, resistant or susceptible to each one of those antibiotics. And then that could then guide the choice of which antibiotic um, to, uh, to use for, for this individual. So for example, here, you would think, uh, we, we would conclude that prescribing any of those three antibiotics that I'm circling should resolve the infection. Now, the challenge that I mentioned is that this antibiotic susceptibility profile is not actually available immediately at the point of care. Uh, it, rather, it can take several days to return. And typically, one has to, want to prescribe an antibiotic uh, at the point of care, even before you have the results of, the, of that profile. And that's, what's, that's what is referred to by the empiric in the empiric antibiotic treatment. So our goal will be to see, could we use machine learning algorithms to recommend a choice of antibiotic at the point of care, even before that antibiotic susceptibility profile is available. And the reason, one of the reasons why this, this problem is very well suited for machine learning is that this antibiotic susceptibility profile, although not available immediately at the point the treatment decision has to be made, is made available eventually, and it provides the perfect training data for trying to develop machine learning algorithms for this. Now the current best practice for prescribing antibi empiric antibiotics at, uh, for uncomplicated urinary tract infections is to follow what are known as the IDSA guidelines. I'm showing you an example of them on the right-hand side here. It looks at, for example, uh, the patient's uh, allergy history, um, whether they have um, uh, previously been observed to have resistance to uh, one of several different antibiotics. And based on the, that makes a decision about whether to recommend, for example, uh, fluoroquine or uh, one of the first line antibiotics that I'd mentioned earlier. Now, one of the big challenges with these clinic, existing clinical guidelines is that they're very seldom followed. So as part of our study, one of the things that we looked at was uh, across all of uh, uh, what was previously called Partners Healthcare, so Brigham Women's Hospital, MGH, including outpatient clinics, how often these treatment guidelines are followed. And we found that they were very seldom followed. Now, there could be a number of reasons for why they would be seldom followed. Uh, one reason might just be uh, due to um, uh, there not being the right clinical decision support to help encourage uh, the use of these guidelines at the right time. Um, but it could also be conjectured that that these guidelines 
um, either aren't uh, well, well designed for this population. And so perhaps clinicians think that they would be able to do a little bit better than these guidelines, given what they know about their particular population. Or perhaps these guidelines don't reach the right trade-off um, in terms of risk and benefit that the clinicians are actually looking for for their particular patient population. What we'll be looking at is how one can, instead of using these existing guidelines, think about learning them from scratch, um, using local data, in particular data from Brigham Women's Hospital and MGH, and in doing so, also provide a knob that we could think about uh, in terms of that risk uh, benefit trade-off, and I'll refer much more to that later on in the talk. So before I get into the details, um, I want to just connect what you heard in Mike's primer to what we're talking about here today uh, in this simple recap slide. And if you weren't at Mike's primer, uh, you could ignore this slide. Uh, but for those of you who were there, uh, Mike introduced uh, the, the goal of learning a policy, which is a function pi, which maps from patient features X to an action A. And he introduced a number of methods for first evaluating how good a proposed policy pi is using observational data. Uh, one method he called outcome regression that's shown here on the right hand side in, uh, in this purple color. And the key challenge that outcome regression solved was that in order to evaluate how good a policy is, one has to be able to assess how good an action is for a patient, that is to say a particular treatment that is prescribed, even for treatments that might never have been given to that patient. In order to do that, one has to somehow extrapolate from the data that one has to new treatments that weren't observed in the data. And for that, there were different techniques proposed. In outcome regression, one, is, one uses regression to fit this function f of xt, which estimates the, uh, the outcome y as a function of the patient's covariate features x and the treatment decision t. And then using that, one can in essence impute the outcome for any potential uh, action that could be taken for a patient. Mike also talked about other methods such as propensity reweighting or doubly robust methods which instead of doing outcome regression, estimate what's known as a propensity score shown here in this E of XT. And this is again, a use of machine learning. Here, what one does is one looks to see what treatments are typically prescribed by clinicians for patients of a particular type. And that's this, uh, regret, that's, uh, this uh, probability distribution T given X, and then uses that to reweight the observed data in order to get an unbiased estimate of how good a policy is. Then the final thing that Mike talked about was how one could use these unbiased estimates of a policy performance within a learning algorithm by directly trying to maximize that, these quantities with respect to that um, with respect to that policy parameters, pi. Now, what made this difficult was the fact that the counterfactuals, meaning what would have happened to a patient had they been prescribed a different action, weren't, aren't typically observed in an observational data set. And that's going to be the point of departure for today's talk, because in this antibiotic resistance setting, our problem is substantially easier. The antibiotic susceptibility profile gives us all counterfactuals. That is to say, we observe, might be six or seven days later, but eventually we observe what would have happened had the patient been prescribed any one of the different antibiotics because we observe the susceptibility or resistance profile for that antibiotic. That means we don't have to predict potential outcomes. We don't have to fit those functions F and we don't have to do propensatory weighting. Now, uh, when I first thought about this problem, I thought, oh, this, this is a substantially easier problem. Does it actually apply to any setting other than uh, antibiotic resistance? Is there, are there other settings in medicine where we could expect to observe all counterfactuals of what would have happened to patient? And as time went on, I've kept on finding more and more examples where such things are relevant. So for example, uh, the road community might be familiar with the use of patient-derived xenograft models uh, in cancer, where one would take a sample from a, a cancer patient uh, from their uh, primary uh, tumor, 
uh, th that sample would then be implanted in a mouse and, uh, and in essence, one builds a model of, of this human cancer in several different mice, uh, which one would then experiment on with different treatments. So one of the mice might get treatment A, another mouse might get treatment B, another mouse might get treatment C, and one then looks to see what actually happens to the mice. So um, which of these different treatments are most successful at resolving the, uh, the underlying cancer. Now, just like in the antibiotic setting that I was describing earlier, here with these PDX models, it's a very time consuming process. And the, res and the results of these PDX models might not be available fast enough in order to just make a treatment choice for a patient. But just like in the antibiotic setting, these results are available eventually, which would give us the data we would need in order to use the algorithm that I'm going to describe to you today. David, if I could uh, just ask a question, maybe a kind of philosophical point, philosophical point, I hope it's not too pedantic. It seems like we're observing all counterfactuals if we completely equate the in vivo with in vitro. Um, but it does seem hypothetically in the future, if we have enough data, then we actually could observe all counterfactuals because a lot of these different treatment regimens are in fact going to be applied over the population. And you could imagine, say, matching patients based on the physiological profile. Um, and so uh, that would, in the future, great, great, great question. Thank you for asking that. So, uh, so first I want to emphasize that asterisk that I have there next to all counterfactuals where I write in the very bottom left, only approximately true. And that's precisely for the reason that you mentioned. Uh, so these, uh, these are only models and, uh, and for a variety of reasons, for example, uh, allergies uh, would be one reason why uh, what you observe in that profile may not be uh, representative of what you would observe when you actually administer the antibiotic to the individual. Um, but then with regards to your second point, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right as well. I mean, part of the reason for, for Mike giving his primer in the way that he did was because um, all of the things that I'm going to be telling you about in today's talk, you could use, even if you didn't have all counterfactuals, by using the techniques that Mike introduced. Right. So you're right that if you had enough data, and if the assumptions that Mike mentioned, for example, of no hidden confounding, of, um, uh, of overlap, uh, no interference, if those assumptions held true, then you would still be able to do the things I'm going to be telling you about today. Um, but there's a reason why I'm focusing on these, this simpler setting. And the reason is because in my lab, when I typically think about how to build algorithms for treatment recommendation, I usually get stuck on those statistical issues that Mike talked about. Because of the fact that we very seldom have so much data, um, there's a very, very long development process in order to get trust in that statistical extrapolation that one would have to do without this setting that I'm describing here. And so we typically don't get to some of these second stage questions, which I want to focus on in today's talk. In particular, I'll be using this simpler setting to focus on what happens after you learn these models. For example, what should that reward function be? What should we be optimizing for when we're learning these treatment strategies? How does one do a proper retrospective evaluation where you compare to clinicians? How should one think about deployment of these models in clinical practice? What about human AI interaction? Questions of trust, usability, questions of should we defer making a recommendation or should we always make a recommendation? So in today's talk, I'll be focusing on these second step of second set of questions. And the use of this simpler setting that you saw here is because it allows us to start to ignore some of those statistical issues that typically don't, that, that typically um, are the major focus when, um, when working with observational data and allow us to start asking some of these other questions, which the community is going to start grappling with over the next several years. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of getting, giving us a, a preview of what those secondary questions are going to be. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. And David, any other questions? You, yeah, one more question about um, the counterfactuals. How, how do you account for the possibility that doing nothing would have resulted in improvement in the patient? So if you, if you didn't treat, there's some percentage of individuals who, who will improve on their own. I'm going to assume that one has that as another action. So, uh, for example, in the, um, in the antibiotic setting, you might imagine uh, taking uh, ha having one of the samples where you do not give an antibiotic and you might look over time, does the, uh, does the, the bacteria just mysteriously die on its own? Um, of course, 
that ignores many of the subtle issues about um, placebo effect, for example, um, but uh, goes along with that asterisk where I say this is only approximately true. Got it. Any other questions? If they're great questions. All right. So the in today's talk, I'll be starting to uh, address some of these questions about what happens after, first of all, how does one learn a policy in order to take into consideration um, potentially multiple competing goals or objectives that one would want to try to uh, satisfy when learning a policy? How does one do that proper evaluation? And how does one simplify deployment? And at the end of the, today's talk, uh, I'll uh, do something that, I, that we don't often do in, in talks, which is talk about some of the mistakes that my research group made along the way to the, the findings that I'll be telling you about. And my goal in telling you these mistakes is to uh, let it be a learning experience for all of us. So to begin, uh, let's now think about what are these policies? So uh, if you hadn't attended Mike's talk, don't worry, what I'll be telling you about is self-contained. So we'll be talking about individualized treatment rules, which are simply a mapping from patient features X to treatment decisions A. Um, these are widely studied in the biostatistics community, which, as I mentioned earlier, typically assume observational data, whereas here we're going to be looking at a simpler setting of fully observed outcomes. And there are, generally speaking, two types of approaches for learning individualized treatment rules, uh, indirect methods and direct methods. The indirect methods would take as input the patient features, and then they would, they would learn a model to predict each of the different outcomes, potential outcomes of what would happen if each of the different actions were given. So for example, here there are the four antibiotics that we'll be considering in today's talk. And one learns, one uses a machine learning model to predict um, uh, susceptibility or resistance of the, of the bacteria to the uh, uh, NIT antibiotic. You learn a different model to predict susceptibility versus resistance for SXT, different model to predict it for Cipro and so on. Then one takes those predictions and one combines them in some way. So for example, uh, one could say, let's choose the lowest spectrum antibiotic, um, which this sample is predicted to be susceptible to. And that would be one, one way of combining the four different predictions that one gets into a treatment decision. And so that's an indirect method. Uh, and as Mike alluded to in his talk, one of the challenges with using this indirect method for learning individualized treatment rules is that the models themselves could be quite complex, even if the ultimate function going from features to treatment decision is quite simple. And so from a statistical perspective, this indirect method might be putting too much of its modeling power in this middle step, which is actually not relevant for getting a simple treatment decision. So instead, direct policy learning will again take as input features, but now we're going to directly learn a policy pi, which is a function that maps features to directly to treatment decisions, completely bypassing this intermediate step of predicting outcomes for each of the individual actions. And that'll be the focus of today's talk. So uh, I need one more definition now, which is how do we evaluate how good a treatment decision is? And for that, we're going to use the notion of a reward function. So the reward function R, and I'm bolding it here to denote that it's a vector, will specify us the, how, how good is the outcome associated with any possible action. And that'll allow us to evaluate the, how good a policy is. Um, and uh, here, there is a bit of a change of notation. Um, in Mike's talk, and I'm mentioning this at the very bottom of the slide, in Mike's talk, he was using outcomes as y, and he referred to potential outcomes y of a, telling you the outcome for each possible action, little a. Um, these are identical to rewards. So reward is a vector, which gives you the potential outcome for each action. The reason why I'm having a change of, um, of terminology here is because the techniques that we developed were very much inspired by work that happens at the reinforcement learning community where typically the language that's used is that of a reward function or a utility function. So the training data that we have consists of tuples, X and R, 
where X are the features and R is the vector of rewards associated with each action. So now let's look at a simple example to see if we understand this. Uh, remember I mentioned to you that in today's talk, we'll be working with four different antibiotics and each antibiotic for a given patient is going to be either resistant or susceptible for that patient's sample. Now, um, a very simplistic reward definition would simply look at resistance versus susceptibility, ignoring all secondary considerations such as cost or second line versus first line and so on. So in that case, for this individual sample, the R vector would consist of 0, 1, 1, 1, meaning the reward for giving the antibiotic NIT is 0 because it does not resolve the infection. Whereas the reward for giving any of the other three antibiotics is one, because if you were to give any, if you were to recommend any one of those three antibiotics, then it would be successful at resolving the infection. And uh, our goal is going to be to maximize reward. So high values of R are good. And it should also be clear to you now how I'm going to be able to assume that the training data consists of these Rx tuples. Because in this setting, we're assuming that we have the results of the antibiotic susceptibility profile during learning. And so that susceptibility profile will give us exactly this vector R for each of the examples. So next we have to think about how we're going to now try to maximize the reward. So we want to try to learn a policy pi, and right now I'm leaving it abstract in a moment I'm going to define how one parameterizes it. Where our goal during learning is going to be to try to maximize the expected reward, meaning on average we want to do as well as possible on all across all patients. Now the expected reward consists of first uh, taking expectation with respect to patients features X and reward vectors R. So that's just summing over the examples in your training data. Then a sum over potential actions A. This action space for us is going to consist of four actions. Looking at the reward associated with the action little a times an indicator function, which is one if the policy pi recommends action little a and zero otherwise. So this sum will simply pull out the reward for the action that the policy recommends. So to parameterize these, uh, these policies pi, we're going to use a score function f for every possible action little a. Um, for those of you who have ever done multi-class classification, it's the same idea there where, um, where you might, for example, have a score for every class. So we're going to learn a different function f, which tells us in essence how good is this action little a on this sample x. And then the policy pi is going to be defined as the arg max over possible actions little a of f of a x. So we're going to just choose the action which has the highest score. Now, if we plug in this definition for the policy pi into the formula I showed above, what we get now is that the learning problem is to maximize over these score functions f of a, one for each possible action, of the expect expectation of the sum over all possible actions of the reward of that action times the indicator of whether the arg max over all possible these scores is equal to little a. Now the challenge for those of you who are familiar with machine learning is that this is a very hard optimization problem. And here is where we're going to start to use some tricks. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to replace this objective with a new objective where we, in essence, use a soft max for this indicator function. Um, and that's shown here as the log of the exponential of f of a divided by this normalization term, which sums over all possible actions. And uh, in some sense, as you were to, if you were to scale these f's, if you were to have a temperature and scale them all to be very large, then this function ends up looking a lot like that indicator function. Um, but um, but this, this, this now has a couple of nice properties. So um, one thing about the, oh, and the, sorry, one other change that I'm making is um, instead of maximizing, I'm minimizing and I'm just putting a minus sign in front. So this new objective function we prove in our uh, KD 2020 paper uh, is a, a convex function um, that's very easy to show. 
but also it has some very nice properties. In particular, with enough data, one could show that if you were to optimize this function instead of the one shown on the top, then one can actually still recover the optimal policy where the optimal policy is defined in terms of that top function. There are a couple of assumptions one has to make in order to get that. Um, so that is to say, we've now got a computational tractable optimization problem with, under some assumptions, the property that is going to recover the optimal function according to the function, according to the optimization problem that we had wanted to solve. Now, the last thing I need to tell you about is how does one parameterize these functions at? In David, our work, yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is that in the infinite data limit, that, that statement then? Yes, or? yes. So we're going to be comparing to um, what would have happened had you solved the optimization problem that I show on the top in the infinite data limit. And we're going to ask about um, solving this surrogate problem as the amount of data grows, how quickly we can converge the solution that you would have gotten with the original problem with infinite data. Great, thanks. So one has to parameterize these functions f somehow. Um, one could, of course, use a deep neural network um, for each one of these uh, f functions. And that would be a perfectly suitable route. In fact, we did do that in some of our experiments, although not the ones I'll be telling you about today. Uh, the, the results I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about today make a very simple uh, assumption about these f functions, which is that they are just linear functions. So for every action a, you have a weight vector, which I'll call theta a. And then that score, f of a of x, is simply equal to the dot product between that feature vector theta a and the, and the feature vector for the patient x. Um, and uh, it's, it's under that assumption of linearity of f that I said that this is a convex function. OK, so that's all of the technical detail that I'll be going through um, in today's talk. And now I'm going to switch gears and start thinking through some of the more subtle questions. So we've got a learning algorithm. How do we use it? Well, one of the first things that we need to do is to define these word for reward functions R and think about how does one derive that from the data that you have. I gave you a very simple example of a reward function R, which looked at just for a given antibiotic, does it resolve the infection or not? But that's not nearly enough. So clinicians take much more into consideration when deciding what antibiotic to prescribe. In particular, a major concern in medicine today is of the overuse of second line antibiotics. These are antibiotics that we would prefer not to use because they're broad spectrum. They tend to resolve a large number of different bacterial infections. And we worry that if we use them too much, then just by natural selection, bacteria are going to develop that become resistant to that, those, back, those antibiotics. So we want to use as few broad spectrum or second line antibiotics as possible. I'm going to use those two words interchangeably. So in fact, then the goal that we're going to want to optimize for when learning a treatment policy is quite a bit more complex than what I had alluded to earlier. We've got to make this trade-off between a individual level quantity, do we resolve the infection for this patient, and a population level goal, which is using as little second line antibiotics as possible. So we could think about that trade-off by this plot shown in the very far right hand side here. You could think about this as aggregate statistics of how good our policy is. One could look, for example, at the x-axis here, which just looks at how often are we recommending antibiotic, which does not resolve the infection, what we call ineffective antibiotic therapy. We would like that to be as low as possible, meaning we would like to always choose an antibiotic that will, um, will always be susceptible for this patient's bacteria. Now, on the y-axis, I'm showing aggregate statistics along a different dimension, which is what fraction of the time does our policy recommend a broad spectrum or second line antibiotic? We would also like that to be as low as possible. But here's the trade-off. It's very easy to get a very low IAT rate just by giving all second line antibiotics. In fact, that would typically receive, result in IAT rates that are, that are, that are um, well under um, uh, 5%. But that doesn't uh, uh, satisfy our other goal. On the other hand, we could use no second line antibiotics, but because there are many patients who do have uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, that would result in a much higher IAT rate. 
So we would like to be as close as possible to the origin, and there's this trade-off between these two different criteria. And the goal of our learning algorithm is going to be to try to balance that trade-off. We want to try to find a solution that is as close to the origin as possible, uh, taking both of these two things into consideration. And what trade-off you end up choosing is going to end up being something which is a policy choice, not something that I as an algorithm designer can say what is right, but rather something that, for example, um, uh, either uh, the, uh, in the Association of Infectious Disease Clinicians or perhaps um, um, each individual uh, hospital institution might, might give guidelines toward you know, where do they want to be in this trade-off. So what we're going to give now is an algorithm that allows one to trade off between these two quantities and in some sense to try to learn a set of treatment policies that can achieve this whole entire curve. That would then allow one to choose which, which policy makes the most sense for them. The way that we're going to do that now is going to be to expand this reward function R. Whereas previously I thought of R as just a single number for each possible action, now I'm going to talk about composing R from, its un, from underlying factors. So for each sample now, I'm going to again take as input the specimen features, so the patient features X, that consists of, for example, past antibiotic usage, comorbidities of the patient, their age, uh, also information about, let's say, location of where the sample specimen was taken, and so on. Um, we're going to take as input the treatment effectiveness, Y. That's what I had previously been calling R. So that's going to be one if the sample is susceptible and zero if the sample is resistant. And now we're going to additionally take as input an indicator vector C that's going to tell us the treatment spectrum for the antibiotic. Um, in this case, the vectors C are going to be um, the same for every single specimen, assuming that we're using the same ordering over the four actions. In particular, it's going to be 0011, where the first two antibiotics are uh, our first line antibiotics, so this treatment spectrum is zero, and the second two antibiotics are second line antibiotics, so the treatment spectrum is one. Now, we're going to then take these two constituent factors, y and c, and we're going to define that the overall reward function, r of a, is equal to a convex combination of these two different quantities, y and c. So uh, we're going to define that combination by this parameter omega, and we'll say for a given choice of omega, the reward function is equal to omega times y of a plus 1 minus omega times 1 minus c of a. Now, um, remember that I defined c of a is equal to 1 if it's a second line antibiotic. So 1 minus c of a is an indicator of whether it's a first line antibiotic. Um, am I saying that wrong? Do, do, do. Uh, we want this to be uh, high, and so we want uh, we want this to be an indicator of whether it's a first line antibody. Yes, uh, so, so C of A is, is uh, one if it is a uh, uh, first line antibody and zero otherwise. I think that's the direction we want. And so then we get the following property: as omega increases, we get lower rates of, I, of inappropriate antibiotic treatment because we are going to be emphasizing more this uh, this y uh, reward. And as omega decreases, we're going to be uh, using less and less second line antibiotic, um, second line antibiotics, which is a good thing, but at the consequence of having more and more. IAT rates. So omega now gives us the knob that we're going to need to be able to trade off these two things. And our learning algorithm is going to think about omega as a parameter. We're going to learn a set of policies, one policy for a different for each choice of omega. So before I jump into the results, I want to spend some time thinking about how does one evaluate the policy that one gets. And I think this perhaps could be one of the uh, most important lessons for many of us who are using machine learning to learn treatment policies. Uh, and it's something that we put some thought into and we were going to give a name to the, the technique that we're using for retrospective evaluation. And we'll call that the target deployment. And this is drawing inspiration from uh, work in the, epidemiological, uh, in the epidemiological community on what is called the target trial. Um, there's a really nice paper by Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins, which 
introduces that idea for causal inference, except now we're going to be thinking about this notion for deployment. And one of the key ideas behind target trial, target deployment, is that one needs to have very clearly defined eligibility criteria, choices of treatment, and outcomes, so that one can try to do an apples to apples comparison of what it would be to deploy your policy in the real world and in order to compare it in a fair way to, for example, clinical practice. One of the key things that one has to take into consideration when doing such a retrospective evaluation is that if you observe that your policy is doing really well, one needs to be careful that the treatments that, are, that it's recommending and seeming to do well on can't be treatments that wouldn't have been available treatment options at the point in care. Because then, then um, in some sense, you're, you're cheating. You're not, you're not actually getting the, the, you're not able to achieve the wins that you think you would be achieving with a retrospective evaluation. And that's actually one of the reasons why we chose for this work to focus on uncomplicated urinary tract infections. Because there are a number of different exclusion criteria um, that would affect the choice of antibiotics um, for patients who have complicated UTIs, such as, for example, them having had previous, recent previous uh, procedures. So for patients with uncomplicated urinary tract infections, nearly all of the patients receive only one of these four antibiotics, uh, NITXXT, both of which are the first line antibiotics, or uh, Cipro and, or, and Levo, which are the second line antibiotics. Um, moreover, with a couple of exceptions that I'll discuss later, all four of these antibiotics are feasible options at the point of care for patients. So if our algorithms were to recommend one of these four antibiotics and we observe a reward function, which is let's say uh, higher than the observed reward from actual clinical practice for those patients, then that would be a realistic comparison. Again, with one or two exceptions that I'll come back to later. So we're going to compare not just to clinical practice, but also to the existing clinical guidelines that I referred to earlier. Those guidelines, the IDSA guidelines, um, look at a number of factors in order to make their treatment recommendations. Um, one of the factors they look at are the community-wide uh, resistance levels to the SXT um, uh, antibiotic. And in the case where the uh, pre uh, prevalence of resistance to XXT um, exceeds 20% 20, 20 one should always avoid recommending SXT according to these in order to according to the IDSA guidelines. Now it turns out that at MGH and Brigham Women's Hospital the resistance prevalence of XXT, SXT does exceed 20% in the recent years and so this policy in fact reduces to something that's very simple shown here on the right which is if the patient has observed resistance or exposure to the first line antibiotic NIT in the past 90 days, then, um, then we would uh, prescribe a second line antibiotic, uh, Cipro. And if the answer is no, then we give that first line antibiotic NIT. Uh, and the other two antibiotics uh, are ignored according to this guideline. So this is the simple policy pi that we will be, one of the simple policies pi that we'll be comparing our learned policies to. Now, the data that we used for this work uh, was uh, created uh, by, uh, by Sanjak Kanchalal, uh, and we call it the in Boston Infectious Disease Cohort. Uh, it's data ranging over the last 20 years from over 300,000 unique patients uh, who submitted a microbiology specimen to any partner's hospital. Uh, for this work, because of our goal to come up with an apples to apples comparison to clinical practice, we're going to focus on just 14,000 women with uncomplicated UTI who are treated with empiric antibiotics. Um, we're going to derive data uh, features from those patients' past medical history before the decision was made of which antibiotic to prescribe in order to try to match up as closely as possible to the actual clinical setting where our machine learning algorithms would make the recommendation. And when we do training, we're going to be training using just data from 2007 to 2013. And we're going to then test and evaluate our algorithms using data from 2014 to 2016. Now, this was an intentional choice to have a, a, a different set of data for the training set and for the test set because it allows us to 
first mimic the real world setup where in reality you can't train on future data. You can only train on past data and then deploy an algorithm in the future. But secondly, this allows us to assess the effect of data set shift that might be occurring. So um, we don't want our algorithms to overfit to peculiarities in the data in 2007 and 2013, um, which might not generalize into future years. And this allows us to catch those, those, uh, uh, those general, to, to assess that generalization. Now, as I alluded to before, the features we use include demographics, patient comorbidities, lab, past lab tests, the location of where the, um, where the empiric um, antibiotic prescribing is happening. That is to say, where, what's the clinic that the patient is in, where the, where the clinician is making a decision about what antibiotic to prescribe, past antibiotic usage and past resistance. Um, and notably, uh, these last two set of features, past antibiotic usage and past resistance, are very noisy in our data. So um, we're only, in our current work, we're only able to drive this from uh, from this hospital system. And so if patients were receiving antibiotics outside of this hospital system, we don't observe their values. Um, and so we're going to just treat them as missing in our features, in our feature vector. Um, we also consider a number of population level features such as total antibiotic usage colonization, and colonization pressure. Um, and both of these we're going to uh, derive in a temporal fashion, looking at their values in the recent past and further back windows. So remember that I mentioned that we're going to quantify how good any policy is based on these two different criteria. The IAT rate, which is the fraction of time that a woman is prescribed an antibiotic that is ineffective. We want that to be as low as possible. And the second line usage, which uh, we also want to be as low as possible. Now we see here that clinicians uh, are doing quite poorly when it comes to second line usage. We would like second line usage to be much closer to zero. Instead, there's roughly 36% of, uh, of specimens um, uh, of, of uh, empiric antibiotic prescribing was, uh, was of a second line antibiotic in, the, in these institutions. Now, uh, the next thing that we're going to look at is how the IDSA guidelines do. Um, now, that is given to you by this purple point shown on the very bottom here. And we immediately see something that's really surprising. This, the IDSA guidelines will almost never prescribe second line antibiotics in this population. And moreover, they achieve an actual lower IAT rate than clinicians. Um, so this is something that, uh, that, first of all, is a clear answer to the question I raised earlier, which is, are clinicians following the IDSA guidelines? Well, no, they're not, because if they were, then this red point would be down here, overlapping with this purple point. Um, but it also raises some many, many questions, which we've studied in a recent paper that's under review about, well, why is it that clinicians might not be following those guidelines? Um, and uh, we don't have a complete, we don't have a, a final answer to that question. But one thing that I, that I conjecture is that it could be that, um, that there are subpopulations where um, clinicians, despite the fact that this patient is, has an uncomplicated urinary tract infection, clinicians might still be unwilling to tolerate the level of risk associated with giving a first line antibiotic. And it could be that for those subpopulations, they instead choose to give a second line antibiotic. So one conjecture we have is that if we could substantially reduce IAT rates beneath that 11% number of the IDCA guidelines, then the, the new policies might be more palatable for clinicians and might lead to greater adoption of the clinical physician support. Now, I'm also showing you these other points that I'm showing uh, that I'm calling adjusted guidelines. Um, and those adjusted guidelines are nothing other than a, com a convex combination of what clinicians are doing today and the IDSA guidelines, um, meaning we're simply giving more and more second line antibiotics as you move along this curve. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is so that one could try to do an apples to apples comparison between clinicians and guidelines. Um, we'd like to be able to see, for example, if we were to give the same amount of second line um, antibiotics as clinicians, what, is the, what would the uh, IIT rate be? And we see that using the adjusted guidelines, you would be decreasing IT rate by almost 2% according to um, using these adjusted guidelines. 
which use slightly more second line antibiotics than the IDSA guidelines. Now let's look to see what our learning algorithms do. Um, before I show you our results, I want to talk about some previously published work on using machine learning to predict uh, um, antibiotic resistance in urinary tract infections. Now, that work did not focus on uncomplicated urinary tract infections, um, and it took a somewhat crude approach to thinking through how one could derive a policy from predictions of, of resistance. So, for example, in that, in that paper published in Nature Yet Medicine by, uh, by Yellen et al., they have one policy that they call the unconstrained policy that's shown here and by this purple uh, X mark on the top left. That unconstrained policy simply will take, it's an indirect method, it predicts the resistance for uh, every antibiotic and it'll simply choose the antibiotic which, um, is, uh, um, which is most likely to not lead to resistance. Um, and unsurprisingly, it would choose a second line antibiotic almost all the time, which is why you see um, the, the point all the way up here, close to 100% second line usage and very low IAT rates. They also consider uh, a constrained method that will take the output of their uh, indirect method and will attempt to match second line usage, but otherwise choose the antibiotic that has um, highest uh, uh, probability of, uh, or sorry, lowest probability of being resistant. And that would get you this uh, cyan uh, point shown here. And by the way, just to, to point out, um, we re-ran these learning algorithms on our uncomplicated UTI uh, cohort. So this is based on the same data that I'm showing you uh, for the other points. Now, our direct policy learning algorithm gets the following curve that I'm showing you here. Every blue point corresponds to a different choice of omega. So there are several different policies that I'm showing you, and that allows us to then ask the question of, well, which policy um, would we want to deploy? Well, that depends on which trade-off between second line usage and IAT rate is most palatable in, in the particular clinical setting we're considering. So for example, we might choose to choose this policy shown here by this blue point. And in this policy, it uses the same amount of second line uh, antibiotics as clinicians today, but notice that it substantially reduces the IAT rates beyond what the adjusted IDSA guidelines would get you. Um, and here, 25% um, fewer women would get uh, ineffective antibiotics according to this new po learned policy compared to clinical practice. Now, we might say, oh, well, you know, maybe we don't have to be quite far that down. Um, maybe we want to prioritize using less second line antibiotics. And in that case, we might want to be down here. Uh, so we would choose this policy shown here by this blue dot. And there we would almost eliminate second line antibiotic usage, um, but uh, at the consequence of having uh, higher IIT rates, still substantially lower than what, what one would get using IDSA guidelines. So next I want to move to the question of how does one simplify the deployment and at the same time as I talk through this, I'll start to give you some intuition on what were the features that were predictive of uh, in, in our learned policies. So one of the challenges of trying to deploy our learned policy, for example, at uh, Mass General Hospital and Brigham Women's Hospital is that this policy requires a large number of inputs. The models I showed you just uh, earlier had over 900 features. Um, feeding into those linear models. Um, those were, I think, 900 features that were um, uh, selected for use in, uh, in the models. So we want to ask the following question then. Can we construct a simple treatment policy that achieves competitive performance with using the full feature set? And I think this is going to be an important part of the machine learning pipeline in trying to develop uh, treatment policy recommendation algorithms. One might start with a very direct machine learning approach like what I just mentioned, but then we need to try to really understand it and distill it to get something which is easier to deploy. We introduce a method that I'll tell you about now that we call policy distillation that um, allows us to distill the policy into something that's much simpler. And we got it by really trying to understand what were the treatment decisions that, the, that our learned algorithm made. And, um, and we realized, first of all, that often the most important treatment decision it made was not the particular choice of antibiotic, but just the choice of first line versus second line. So our new simple, easily deployable policy is going to first learn a simple model, F, that's going to be a small model to quantify the probability the patient needs a second line treatment. I'll tell you how we learned that in the next slide. Then we're going to use a threshold T, 
based on a desired trade-off between IIT and second line usage. And if for a given patient X, F of X is greater than that threshold T, then deterministically we're going to prefer um, the second line antibiotic Cipro over the first line antibiotic, uh, uh, first line antibiotics NIT and SXT. And if F of X is less than T, we're going to have a different preference. Again, these are deterministic preferences of NIT over SXT over, over Cipro. And these are preferences that are relevant for this institution. So you might have a slightly different ordering somewhere else. And then we're going to just walk down that ordering and we're going to choose the preference. Uh, we're going to choose the, the uh, antibiotic which, for which the patient has neither prior resistance nor prior exposure. So this is going to be a very simple policy depending on what features show up in that model learned in step one. Now to drive that model, uh, of choosing between first line and second line antibiotic, we're going to take the policies pi that I described earlier, the policies learned on a few on a full feature set, and then we're going to learn, we're going to look to see which antibiotics, which for every patient was a first line antibiotic prescribed or a second line antibiotic prescribed. And then we're going to try to mimic those choices. So we're going to now, we're going to throw away the objective function I showed you earlier, and we're going to think about just a binary classification problem to try to predict first line versus second line for every possible patient. And we're going to um, try to find the sparsest model possible to get high classification for, uh, uh, accuracy on that problem. In this case, we're going to use the L1 regularized logistic regression to predict first line versus second line decisions. That allowed us to learn a model that uses only 18 features and which gets performance, which is comparable to that uh, learned on all 900 features. The features that show up in this simple policy include, of course, prior resistance and exposure, as you would expect. Um, uh, previous uh, previous um, antibiotics, I'm uh, sorry, previous uh, infections with E. coli or recent surgery in the past 180 days. Uh, looks at colonization pressure of a variety of different antibiotics over the past 90 days. Location, specifically whether it's outpatient or, or ER, and patient demographics. And whereas one of the, if you looked at one of the blue points that I showed you earlier, it achieved an IAT of 9.4% and a second line usage of 13.9%. This simple policy gets an almost identical IAT and second line uh, value on the held up set. So now we've achieved our goal of having a simple, easily deployable policy. Now, in terms of comparing to clinicians, I've, I've left out a really important point, which is essential for achieving that target deployment that I uh, referred to earlier, which is that sometimes an antibiotic might not be available due to contraindications. For example, um, a sulfa allergy, which would prohibit treatment with SXT, or um, a, a condition um, uh, which is always treated with second line antibiotics. Now, in order to do an apples to apples comparison, we had to somehow derive those quantities from patients' retrospective data. And unfortunately, these are often uh, recorded in free text notes. So we had to develop a natural language processing algorithm that could extract these from free text notes. Um, and then we modified that symbol policy to exclude contraindicated treatments, which affected roughly 7% of the original decisions. Now we're at a setting where we can actually do an apples to apples comparison to clinicians. So this modified evaluation um, the results of that are shown in the very bottom here. We see that now the simple policy, instead of recommending 13% of second line antibiotics, it uses 17.7% second line antibiotics because some of the time we had to use it because of contraindications. But nonetheless, we still see a 50% reduction in second line usage compared to clinicians and 20% relative reduction in, uh, in IAT rates relative to clinicians. So um, in the last one minute, I want to just give you um, uh, an example of some of the mistakes that we made when developing this, uh, these algorithms. So first, let's think about where are the labels coming from? Well, there's a, one of the tasks used is called mini, minimum um, inhibitory concentration, um, is, is the value of the amount of, um, of antibiotics that you would need to give to a sample in order to see that the uh, bacteria being killed. And so the minimum inhibitory concentration um, will give you, there will be some cutoff threshold there where if you're below that, if you're, if you're um, above that threshold, you say that the, um, the sample is susceptible to that antibiotic. If you're below the threshold, you're saying it's resistant. 
And so there's a break point that has to be chosen. And those break points are continuously changing with time. Um, in order to develop the labels, we used the 2017 break points. And we applied them retrospectively to all of the past data. Now, in our first attempts at doing machine learning here, we used clinical notes as, um, as, uh, as additional features for prediction. And we found that um, rather than natural language, and some of the most important predictors were actually years that were written in those clinical notes, years like 2010, 2009, 2014, and so on. And we were really surprised with that. We knew that resistance rates changed across time, but we didn't expect such a high association. Now, as we dug into the data, we looked, one of the first things we looked at was a plot of resistance rates across time. And we saw that for several of the antibiotics, we observed very high resistance rates in the earlier years and very low resistance rates later. We then dug down to look to see, well, what were the underlying um, um, MIC values that led to these resistance rates? So, you know, at, applying the 2017 thresholds. And we saw that in these earlier years, the distribution of observed minimum inhibitory concentration values were always much higher for these earlier years. And in hindsight, what we realized is that the machine that was being used to drive these labels, in fact, had an additional row added um, roughly in 2007, which allowed for testing of lower concentrations than ever, be, than ever earlier. Um, and as a result of that, um, in, in earlier years, there were never any samples with values lower than this cutoff uh, of, that I'm showing you here of one. And so all samples beneath those years were labeled as resistant. And the way that resolved that issue is just by uh, using data from 2007 onward. Um, in the second example, uh, we observed, uh, so a few months went by, uh, we learned some new policies, and we observed now that location features were really important. And as we tried to understand, well, why is it that location features are so important, um, and really dug into the data, we again observed something unusual. We saw that resistance rates over time for the SXT uh, antibiotic looked like this. Um, and as we dug down and looked at resistance rates as a function of hospital, we saw that Brigham Women's Hospital had very low resistance rates observed for that antibiotic in the years before 2016, whereas for MGH it was much higher. And there was really no reason why there should be such a big difference between hospitals. Um, again, we looked at the underlying um, uh, data that led to those uh, resistance rates, and we saw that for Brigham Women's, Women's Hospital, um, again, the observed values were always much lower. We concluded after further discussions with, um, with the microbiology lab at, uh, at both hospitals that the reason for these differences is that until 2015, Brigham Women's Hospital tested resistance to the combination drug by looking at resistance to just one of its, um, just one of its uh, constituent uh, drugs. Uh, and as a result, the, because of the differences in weight, the relevant uh, MIC values should have, uh, thresholds should have been very different. Um, after correcting that, uh, you see now that you get back to uh, what, what looks much normal. Um, but this, of course, then had a consequence. So for example, our predictive performance at predicting resistance for that combination drugs dropped substantially because you can no longer rely on that uh, false location information uh, in order to be predictive. So this is just to give you some insight into some of the checks and balances that we had to do in developing the policy that I, that I described here. So in conclusion, I gave you a case study of how to use machine learning to suggest treatments at the point of care. I introduced the concept of a target deployment to try to frame retrospective evaluation. Where one has to get an apples to apples compare, try to set yourself up to, to have an apples to apples comparison of what treatments would have actually been available at the point of care, restrict yourself to just those when evaluating compared to uh, clinical practice. Um, I showed you how one could learn treatment policies in multi-objective settings um, in, or, in order to create these curves that I showed you uh, earlier. Um, I showed you how machine learning can be used as a tool after learning policies to distill them into the much simpler policies that are easier to deploy. And I told you how mistakes in retrospective evaluation are commonplace, not exceptional. And that, for example, checking for data that shift um, and model introspection are essential tools uh, in, at least that in my lab's experience for developing safe and robust machine learning that we can think about as being reliable to move forward toward a 
uh, uh, randomized clinical trial.